And welcome to At Issue. I'm H. Wayne Wilson, and we're so glad that you're able to join us for this very important program where we're going to have the two candidates running for the 92nd Illinois House seat. Uh, the 92nd House seat is from Peoria Heights down to the southern reaches of Peoria County. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a position held currently by Aaron Schock, who is uh, stepping aside to run for Congress, and therefore it is an open seat. And let me introduce the two candidates to you. First, Jahan Gordon. Jahan is the Democratic candidate. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. Jahan is the Diversity Retention Coordinator at ICC, Illinois Central College, and that means you do what? Um, it's in, in my capacity, I ensure that students are successful once they get to ICC. Oftentimes, it's uh, quite difficult for students to balance the uh, work life, family life, as well as uh, school life. So what I do is um, I do a lot of intervention with students that are um, on the cusp of potentially dropping out of ICC. So what I do is I ensure that they have the resources and that they're connected to the proper places so that we can retain them so that they can go on and be successful and go on to either a trade or for another four-year college or university. And the Republican candidate for the 92nd House seat is Joan Krupa. Thank you so much for being with us, Joan. Thank you. And uh, you are retired as the CEO at the Heartland Community Health Clinic, which basically was... It was a free clinic when I uh, started in 2001, and uh, it soon became a federally designated community health center serving about 18,000 patients today. So uh, it was my pleasure to be the uh, leader of that group, uh, moving it from one site to six sites in a period of about four years. Okay, this uh, has not been the most pleasant of races. There's something about the 92nd house race that always <laughs> brings out some negative negativity. Let me start by, these are all um, flyers that were mailed to my house. There are 12 different ones. They're from the Democratic Party. They're not from your campaign. They're not from your campaign. They are from the Democratic Party of Illinois. Eight of them, if I may use the term, take shots at you, Joan. Um, there are some comments about you know what you will do. Because these are all from the Democratic Party of Illinois, a dozen of them, it might lead someone to believe that you might be holden to the Democratic Party if you are elected to the 92nd House seat. Um, how can you assure us that this is not a prelude to voting with Mike Madigan? Absolutely. Whenever you run for office, I mean, you do this because you want to see your community move forward. The people that will be electing me to this seat live right here in the 92nd District, and that is who I'll be beholding to. And the way that you go about doing that is that you keep your, um, you stay independent. You ensure that you work with not only people from your region, and you not only work with the Democratic Party, but you work bipart in a bipartisan fashion in Springfield. You work with people not only in central Illinois, but you work with people in northern Illinois and southern Illinois, and you work with people across the aisles. And what that does is that allows you to um, find allies and find advocates around the state um, the 92nd district is not an anomaly. There are a lot of other districts that look like the 92nd that have the same issues as the 92nd district. Uh, what I'd like to do is take the time and spend the energy and find who those allies would be. Work together to develop a, a, um, a clear plan that would allow all of our communities to benefit. And in that way, I'll have the ability to continuously and always vote my district, and that's what I plan on doing. And likewise, you've received support from the Republican Party? Yes, I have. Um, How can we be, same question to you. I think uh, the difference is if you look at um, the state elections filing report and you see where the money is that is supporting these campaigns, you'll see that uh, in addition to the Republican uh, House organization, I've received uh, contributions for about from a, a nearly 700 different uh, people that actually reside in central Illinois. And so, therefore, I am not um, uh, beholding to anyone except for the people in central Illinois who I'll represent. Uh, I do think that this kind of literature, which um, um, is 
personally offensive in, in my est estimation, distorting facts and realities uh, put out by the Democratic Party, uh, even though it comes from that source, um, as candidates, we have to be responsible for the kinds of literature that in our name and for our good, quote unquote, uh, goes out. And so at a debate, I asked uh, Jahan if she knew about these that were going out, and she assured me that she did. So even though it's paid for by the Democrats, I think it's important to know that as candidates, we have to take responsibility for what goes out. So you're taking responsibility for the ad that uh, puts uh two past uh, governors, a current governor and a past Absolutely. governor on the screen Absolutely. with the photo of Jahan. Because that is um, a matter of fact. Uh, it's not a matter of innuendo or uh, guessing or um, putting the latest one I find particularly interesting with me in the middle of uh, my best friends who I've never met, of course, Donald Trump and Bill Gates and suggesting that because um, that uh, uh, there's some kind of corporate class uh, that I belong to. Um, gee, I wish I did belong to the same group that Donald Trump and, and Bill Gates have in terms of resources, but uh, uh, I could certainly do a lot of good in the community with those resources. Jahan? Actually, we've stuck to facts. Uh, we talk about taxes. We've talked about uh, my opponent's tax record when she was on the county board. Those are facts. We talked about her relationship with insurance companies. That's not innuendo, that's fact. What relationship is that, Jahan? Well, you have been supported by Tom Cross. Tom Cross takes a significant amount of money from insurance companies. The same insurance companies that deny, constantly deny people with pre-existing conditions. Jahan, how do you explain then that on your election filing report, you received $2,500 from an insurance company, uh, from Humana? Uh, I, I don't understand. I think that's a direct uh, connection where, you know, if you're going to stretch it, I, I have a hard time seeing where my getting money from um, uh, Tom Cross has anything to do with this tight, uh, quote-unquote, cozy relationship with insurance companies. It just well, doesn't make sense. Beyond that... Um, you also have some significant holdings in United Healthcare, which is a large insurance giant in this country. Significant holdings um, is a matter of opinion. When my husband retired from Caterpillar, uh, we took uh, our Caterpillar stock and diversified according to a financial manager. And our diversification is our nest egg that we plan to retire on. So yes, we have been very happy to, um, been fortunate that um, uh, we saved and we uh, worked very hard and we do have some holdings in a number of companies. And I put that on our economic interest disclosure form. Let me and, ask, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Uh, let me ask a direct question. Mm -hmm. um, the Jahan Gordon campaign says that you, when you were on the county board, voted in favor of raising taxes and fees 11 different times. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Uh, this is another distortion. Uh, actually, if you look at the time that I started on the county board, uh, what the tax rate levy was and what it was when I concluded my service, it actually went down over those years. And yes, the county board salary was raised during that time. I happened to be opposed to it on two different occasions. In fact, I even suggested that perhaps we should do away with salaries for county board members, similar to what school board members have. But I will tell you this. Um, in the worst case scenario, my salary that she has uh, and her campaign continuously looks at went up $100 a year from $3,800 per year to $4,400 a year. So I can't uh, particularly retire on something that happened years ago that uh, was really very insignificant and really was less than a cost of living adjustment. And one more quick question for you, sure. Jahan. Uh, you missed 32% of the school board meetings at Pleasant Hill, where you're on the board? Well, actually, that was a distortion. Uh, again, my opponent's campaign, um, if you look at some of the original um, press releases when they held the press conference outside of the school when the kids were about to get out of school, um, at that time, I believe they said that I missed 40%. And then the next quote was 32%. Then it went down to 30%. As you see, the numbers are changing constantly. Um, the facts and figures that I picked up from my superintendent said that I missed um, 
11 of, I believe it was 11 of 14 meetings. Let me uh, explain how those facts and figures came, and it was not a distortion. May 11 of 14, I'm so sorry. Um, okay. I, I will tell you that uh, the information that we had a press conference about came from the school uh, district that uh, uh, Jahan serves. And it was from the time that she started on the board to August of this year. Jahan has consistently said that her experience on the school board is one of the reasons why she should be uh, elected to this very important office. And so I took exception when, through this Freedom of Information Act, from the time she uh, started, which was a little over a year ago, um, to now, she had missed 40% of those meetings. Since that time, she attended a meeting in September and several other special meetings were called in. And so the news media reported that she missed 32%. By her own admission, she missed over a quarter. And my point is, do you really, can you really do a job if you don't show up? And th what prompted the press conference also was that during a 24 hour period, uh, she missed two out of three debates that where we were supposed to be discussing these issues. So I think that attendance and showing up for work is a real issue. A quick response, John? Yes. We were not scheduled for those debates. One, of, one was scheduled and one was canceled. But beyond that, what's so interesting is that you, want, you only want to look at one issue. I had a statement that was released by the president of our school board as well as the vice president that talked about all of the wonderful work that I've been able to do on the school board. What's very interesting is that you forget to bring up the fact that, and you well know this, when I was endorsed by the Peoria Federation of Teachers as well as the Illinois Federation of Teachers, when you and I both went in front of that group, I talked about the fact that our school board was in the middle of a debate with uh, the teachers at Pleasant Hill School. And at that time, there was no contract. And through a lot of my due diligence and working as um, a, an honest broker between the school board, between the teachers' unions reps, between the teachers that were sitting on the negotiating team on the other side of the table, because of the work that I was able to do day in and day out with that group, we were able to secure a fair and equitable contract with those teachers. But you never want to talk about that. I will talk about that, Jahan. And I, um, I'm very encouraged that at your young age that you have taken responsibility and are doing your civic duty. I think that's great. And as I have told you before, I, I hope you have a long and prosperous future in the public arena. I just don't think you're ready for this kind of uh, big leap. And let me talk about uh, my experience in education. Uh, for over 20 years, I have served in a variety of areas from pre-K programs all the way through college. Um, and I was very disappointed when uh, the Teachers Federation endorsed my opponent. I was told at that time by some of the people that because I hadn't run in the primary and because my opponent had been endorsed in the primary by the Teachers Federation, it would be quite difficult for them to endorse, first of all, Republican when traditionally they have supported Democrats, but also someone that was just coming into the um, uh, scene. So, well, let's let's move on mm -hmm. to issues. Let's let's mm -hmm. get away from mm -hmm. the actually. The Peoria Federation of Teachers did not endorse me in the primary, and I the, said the Illinois Federation. Well, the Peoria Federation of Teachers. I'm, did I'm not talking about the state organization. Okay. Let, let, the local organization did not endorse me in the primary, and uh, actually, before they endorsed me, they endorsed Aaron Shock. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to Republican. the topic of education. Um, you've brought it up. Um, Joan, let's start with you. What will you do if elected to improve education in the state of Illinois, and how will you fund it? Mm -hmm. Two very important questions, and frankly, one of the two reasons why I am absolutely passionate about going to the state legislature has to do with education. Both my parents were teachers, and so I, it, teaching is in my DNA. Before I became a healthcare uh, person, I was in education for most of my professional life. Uh, starting off being an elementary school teacher in District 150, uh, being an el uh, elementary guidance counselor, working on the college level with students um, as assistant dean of women, uh, working in an at-risk program for pre-K kids called Bright Futures, which uh, continues today. 
and also working uh, overseas, uh, teaching English as a foreign language, and doing a variety of other things, um, uh, particularly in the area of folks that didn't have access to health, uh, to normal educational experiences. I was director, for example, of adult education in the county jail, serving incarcerated uh, men and women. I also served uh, for pregnant and parenting teens. So I want to just tell you why I'm telling you this, is that that has given me in the trenches experience that I can take to Springfield. For example, the state funds the pre-K at-risk program like Bright Futures. We need to encourage more money being spent on the end that has to do with prevention rather than the end that has to do with cleaning up the mess when our educational system fails. So one of my platform pieces is that I am going to work in a very bipartisan way for educational reform in spending and to put resources into outcomes-based kinds of uh, programs like early childhood education. I also feel very strongly that we have done a disservice uh, by limiting the amount of funds that um, have gone to community colleges, in particular in higher education, in the sense that that funding has stayed flat ever since Governor Blagojevich has taken office. And um, it's becoming more and more difficult for kids uh, that want to go to school to find the resources to do that. John. <clears throat> I think that uh, the work that I do at ICC with students, oftentimes that are coming out of District 150, um, there are oftentimes very, very difficult circumstances that they come to ICC with in terms of uh, being college ready, being able to handle the work um, that is required at the collegiate level. Um, working as a volunteer within District 150, I, I made the conscious decision to go down to Manual High School to volunteer because that is a school that oftentimes gets stigmatized for no reason at all. Um, the work that I do on the school board, you know, I sit on a school board that is in a landlocked area. There is no new residential, no new commercial development. Um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the community is rental property, so it's very difficult to do the essential, uh, the essential things that we ought to be able to do as a school because of the lack of funding. In my opinion, the, re the reason why I ran for office, one of the key reasons, the reason why when I made my announcement uh, 15 months ago, I announced at my high school, Limestone High School in Bartonville, Illinois, I wanted to do it in front of a school uh, to, send a, to send a message that this is the cornerstone issue of this campaign. It's education. I think the reason why I've been able to have the, uh, had the blessing of receiving the endorsement of the Illinois Education Association, the Illinois Federation of Teachers, the Illinois Principals Association, and, and as well as the Peoria Federation of Teachers is because that they understand that my work within District 150, my work on a K-8 school board, my work at ICC, I have a unique perspective as to where our educational system is right now looking at, as you said, community colleges. Community colleges are funded right now uh, at the same level that they were funding at, funded at in 1993. ICC is a great asset in this community and has the ability to do a lot of things that oftentimes the K through 12 system can't do because of uh, failed Republican rules, failed Republican policies like No Child Left Behind, which has to uh, be done away with. No Child Left Behind, truly puts educators in a position where they have to teach the test. And no longer are we able to um, teach critical thinking skills. Uh, what is, and those are the skills that will be required for this new knowledge base economy that we have in the 21st century. Uh, when looking at funding mechanisms, we have to move um, towards a more fair and equitable funding system. Right now, um, too much of the funding of our schools, of our public schools, relies on property taxes. The state of Illinois right now is funding, state funding to public schools is around 29%, and it's supposed to be uh, the majority, 51%. Uh, the majority of that money is made up by property taxes. So if you live in an area like Dunlap, uh, you have plenty of resources for your schools. Oops. But if you live in an area um, like Pleasant Hill School, like Bartonville Grade School, like Manual High School, 
the funds that you get come from the homes that are in that area, and that is unfair, and that's not a fair, uh, a fair playing field for our young people to be launching from. Let's move to health care. What steps would you propose, if elected, to improve health care in Illinois? You know, one of the primary issues that I, I spend a lot of time going door to door every day. When I leave here, that's where I'll be going. Um, when I talk to families, young families, when I talk to folks that have retired, like my parents, health care is an issue that they stare in the face every day. And it's an issue that we, as uh, folks who are looking to become elected, that we have to confront. One of the things that I know is that health care should be a right, not a privilege. And that's what it is essentially right now. It's a privilege for those that can afford it, and those that can't afford it have to make do with whatever they have. Um, I am in favor of supporting Senator Barack Obama's health care plan, which plans to cover every uh, man, woman, boy and girl in this country. I don't believe that any hard-working middle-class family in this country should be turned away because of, pre because of a pre-existing condition. But as we all know, the state of Illinois just does not have the money to uh, bring forth a universal health care plan that will cover all. We just don't have the funding. Uh, what I'd like to do is look at a hybrid approach that would bring uh, folks to the table We'd, it would have to be a situation where we'd have to have a lot of federal leadership. That would be a requirement. That would be a requirement, and that's necessary, because of the state of our funding here in Illinois. We'd have to have private insurers brought to the table, and we'd also need uh, employer-provided health care. And we would need to sit down and figure out how can we make this happen. Uh, it should be um, paramount that preventative care mental health care, and paternity also be covered. Oftentimes those are, um, those are situations that people have to cope with day in and day out, and they have no health care coverage. And that, in my opinion, is unfair to the 1.8 million Illinoisans that do not have quality health care. And there are hundreds of thousands of others that have less than adequate health care services in this state. Senator Joan. Clearly, we have a broken health care system, and that's why 80% of the people in the United States name health care as one of the reasons that they are going to vote one way or the other. Interesting that uh, my opponent has brought up the very things that I've been involved with in the last six years, forming collaborations among interested parties, working um, for uh, expansion of health care access because it's one thing to say uh, we want to, for everyone to have a medical card. It's quite another if they can't get into a doctor's office because those medical cards are not accepted. Um, at Heartland Community Health Clinic, one of the reasons it's been so successful is because it's been truly a collaborative partnership between uh, the private and public sector uh, in that it is a not-for-profit organization and it does receive donations from people and corporations that see it as a, a blessing to this community. And yes, indeed, I think that access is absolutely important and a necessity for a healthy community and that's why uh, I called my campaign, you know, building a healthy community. But in, a, in addition to that, I think we have to realize that uh, this is a, a problem that cannot be solved simply by patchwork uh, ways where one state has something, another state has another, and we need to really have a strong federal uh, policy, and I agree with Jahan on that. But we, there's lots we can do in the meantime, rather than just uh, having rhetoric on what a shame it is that people don't have access. For one thing, we do have a community health center uh, grant access program in the state that should continue to be funded. And that would be one of the things that I would vote for and uh, work to very diligently to expand across the state. Uh, secondly, there is a very high need for uh, electronic medical records so that people that go to one physician are not then, uh, because of lack of these kinds of uh, easily transportable um, information systems, they may receive the same test two or three times, raising uh, an, a spiraling health care bill to the state and to them and to the providers. So I believe in uh, 
trying to find a solution on the state level as well as working on the national level. Very quick, quickly, in 25 seconds or so, both of you have suggested initiatives that are going to cost money. Mm -hmm. well, how are we going to do that? We're $2 billion short on the previous budget in the state of Illinois. Correct, and that's again one of the reasons why I want to run for this office. I have had experience in managing a small business. Uh, it's a not-for-profit business, but one where I had to worry about making payroll and I had to worry about um, how we were going to pay the bills. Uh, I've served on the county board where I've known how to manage budgets and keep them within. And so I have some experience in this area that my opponent does not have. Uh, but I will say this, if we had stayed within our budget, one billion dollars of natural revenue growth, which we had the last six years, would have gone a long ways. Jahan. What we have to do is we have to ensure that we look at cogent proposals that will allow us as a state to cover our essential needs, our essential needs of education, health care, public safety. Looking at those essential needs, we have to um, understand that right now there is a lot of government waste and a lot of government spend, government uh, spend and bloat. I would like to take a look at how do we tighten our belts as a state? How do we look to um, revenue generating sources, uh, ones that in the legislature there would actually be political will in terms of passing? Um, there have been a lot of proposals that have been brought forth to look at how do we pay for some of these, uh, these worthwhile initiatives that we know that we need in our state. But also understanding what there is the political will to pass is the greatest challenge that we have in front of us. Right now, across the state, you have a lot of elected officials that are currently in Springfield that are looking to um, go back to their own constituents and be able to look them in the eye and, said, and say that I did all that I could to do everything that I can for you. And that's what I'll do in Springfield. And with that, we've gone over our time. <laughs> Thank you to Jahan Gordon, the Democratic candidate Thank for you. the 92nd House seat. Thank and you. your challenger is Joan Krupa, the Republican candidate. And uh, we will not be here next week, but we'll be back in two weeks with another edition of At Issue. Thanks for being with us.